All right, welcome everybody. Welcome to Drawing Together. My name is Scott Meyer. This is Drawing Together with Artists Network. Um, we meet every Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern to draw together. So this is what we're working on today. It's a drawing of this old town road. Um, thought it was a lot of fun, a lot of really fun texture to get into, um, focusing on creating depth, applying a little bit of perspective to this to try to create some of that depth, um, but primarily focusing on texture and value for this one. So uh, I had a lot of fun doing this preparatory drawing to kind of wrap my head around it. Um, before we get started, I want to welcome everybody. Um, I love seeing all the comments. If you're new, I want to see where you're viewing from. Um, we get people from all over the world here. Um, we draw it together. You can find the reference image in the description below. That's the one that's right below me here. And uh, you can bring that up full screen, you can draw along, or you can just watch and then draw along later. Um, and then you'll find a link in the description to uh, artistnetwork.com, to the page for this episode where you can uh, share your drawing when you're, when you're done, because uh, I love seeing everybody's work. We've been seeing a lot more of them, some great bridge drawings lately, um, and also the sheep that we did was, uh, was fantastic. So thank you everybody for sharing your work. Um, if you ever want any feedback and you want to post it there, uh, you know, feel free to, um, you know, type something in the comments there and I'll, I'll do my best to provide some feedback. So, um, materials today. So this is charcoal. Um, I worked on this with using the, um, this is the Legion Stonehenge paper. So this is a cotton rag paper. Um, really enjoy working with this one. So it's nice acid free. It's originally a printmaking paper, um, that works really well for drawing. Um, it can get a little bit tricky because sometimes it can really hold the materials um, and it may not it'll kind of erase back to that bright white. But I've, I really enjoy this and I've talked a lot about working on rag paper, but it's kind of my preferred paper. But um, if feel free to work on whatever material that works best for you. This can also work really well for uh, if you're working in graphite. Um, okay, other materials, uh, charcoal pencils. I've got a couple of the 2B um, that are sharpened, ready to go. So I'll be do, doing a lot with the 2B, it's kind of a, a medium um, hardness of charcoal. And then I have the 6B extra soft to get me some really rich darks. I need to be a little careful with those so the, the cores can break. I have some vine charcoal I'm gonna use to create some initial kind of layout. My trusty blending stump, you can see I used this already, so it's really loaded with charcoal. That's gonna come in really handy for the texture. Um, and then my erasers, I've got my kneaded eraser. I'll be using that quite a bit. I've got this rubber eraser um, and I've been using a lot that have it kind of carved down. I used a razor blade to carve this into a kind of a wedge. And then this mono zero eraser that's also been kind of shaped down a bit. Um, and that provides a little bit more detail there. So it'll be a lot, quite a bit of erasing in order to achieve that texture that we're going for. Um, if you have any questions, um, I, uh, you know, I'm gonna do my best to try to answer them here. If you type them in all caps, I'm more likely to see that. Um, so just, we'll, we'll do what we can. So just ask any question that you have, any observations, share your own experiences. That's what this is all about. Um, oh, there's, okay, so I see a quick um, issue with the reference, um, uh, the reference image. So let me see if I can grab that and I'm gonna drop that into the description here. Hold on just a second. I'll, I'll post it into the chat. My apologies. I had some issues with that and I thought I had it fixed. Of course, everything is running a little bit more slowly because I'm streaming right now. So everything's bogged down. But I do want to make sure that you get that reference image. Um, How's everybody's week going? Um, any, any kind of experiences from the, uh, the sheep drawing that you want to share? That was a lot of fun, like I said. I, I really, really enjoyed that. Um, let's see. Hmm. Not able to... Let me see if this will work. All right, I'm gonna post that into the chat and there we go. 
Let's see if that link will work there. And we're having some streaming issues, it looks like. Another, this is what happens when we stream live. Uh, let me adjust things a little bit, see if we can make it a little bit smoother for everybody. Um, all right, so we are going to do that. If, um, if you are having trouble with the reference image, if you go to the artist, art, artistnetwork.com and you go to the Drawing Together page, um, you'll find a link there to the episode page where the, the reference image is available there. Um, YouTube seems to be struggling a little bit more. Again. We had the same problem last week as well, the, <laughs> kind of a rough start. Um, so hopefully we get this back up and running. Um, What's going on? Okay. Okay, here we are. Back and going. We'll get started. I apologize for the rough beginning. Um, I guess that's the nature of it. Um, uh, all right. What do I want to do? Okay, so for me, um, I like to have everything unified by the light, right? And especially with something like this scene, um, it, it would be really easy to kind of focus on the structure of the buildings, in particular the lines of the building and the perspective. And if I do that though, I run the risk of everything kind of fracturing apart. There's so much going on, in particular in the center of this image, um, it, that we're kind of shearing across that wall. So everything gets squished into this tiny area. And if I focus too much on, on the lines, um, I, I run the risk of everything falling apart. So what I want to focus on is actually the light and shadow and I think that is, um, that is what I'm going to do. So I'm going to start this here. And, and uh, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, so what I'm thinking about, though, is kind of establishing a, a shadow shape that encompasses the shadow that, uh, from the, the building on the left, the, the ground plane, and then that shadow that creeps up the wall. So rather than actually starting by drawing the buildings, I'm going to start by drawing that shadow shape. Um, and this will help me to kind of build up that composition. Um, what I need, actually, is my, I've got this beat up old paper towel. Kind of smooth things down a little bit. I'm not worried about preserving the white of the paper because um, there's, you know, there are some bright spots in here. But um, I, can, I can play with that by increasing the contrast in the drawing overall as a whole. Uh, so if I, if I lose the bright of the, pa the white paper, I can just key everything else down around it. Uh, and I, I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that later as well. So well, that, that didn't really work out. So what I'm thinking about doing is as I, as I look at this reference image, I'm squinting and trying to get a sense for the overall shape. And we have this, this one point right here where that reference image cuts in just beyond this corner. It's generally not a great idea to have a composition where you have a line that leads right out of a corner, but oh, I like it. I, I kind of mess things up like that quite a bit. Um, I kind of like those tangents. Um, but the, let's see. Oh, there's a question. Claude is saying, would you consider embossing the lamppost? Maybe. Um, that's a, it's an interesting uh, concept there. Um, yeah, I, I suppose what we could do is, yeah, is emboss the page a bit to kind of really sharpen that up. Um, so one of the things that this, this stage kind of reminds me of is if you've ever seen some of the original photographs from, you know, the, the mid-1800s, you know, they, they essentially look something like this. All the detail is lost and you just see a, a massive shadow shape. Um, all the, diff all the uh, definition between the various forms within the shadow gets lost. Um, so with that established, you know, I, now I have something I can kind of start to react to. I have the scale of this building, I have the shadow line across here, and I can look at the reference image and compare the two. Um, so I could take this measurement. Let's see, so I, it, it should be about there. So if I go like this, if I take this measurement from the bottom to that shadow line, uh, transfer it up here, it takes me uh, up, you know, midway into that sky area. 
And it, based on that, it, it feels like this needs to come up just a little bit. So based on the measurement I'm making with the, um, with the reference image. So I'm using some comparative measuring. If you're new to that, what comparative measuring is, is you have your, your reference in front of you, whether you're working from life or whether you're working from a photograph. That's in front of you. Close one eye to eliminate your depth perception and hold a pencil out. I've got to stick a stick of charcoal here. And I'm using the, the top of the pencil and my finger here to create a, dis, a distinct length. If I go like this, it might be easier to see. That creates a distinct length. And I'm holding that over the reference image. And I'm taking this measurement from the bottom of the page to that shadow line. Taking that measurement and then I'm carrying that up and I'm placing um, in this bottom mark here I'm, uh, on the top of the shadow and determining where um, that, that measurement carries me up into that sky. And that's just about right. And one of the things I notice as well is if I take this measurement, it is the same length, it's the same distance as the height of this wall as we carry into that shadow. So if I do this, then that wall would kind of extend down here. So this distance here is the same as this distance here. I can do some angle sighting. So holding my pencil, or my, my, in this case my charcoal, closing one eye, lining it on top of my reference image, creating an angle, carrying it across and placing it on top of the drawing. And I can do that with both the bottom and the top lines here. And, and, and what I'm doing is now I'm basically just kind of working through some of the major, major forms in this drawing and seeing how things will need to kind of adjust from there. Um, I have a question here. Do I animate? I do not. And I've never done any sort of animation. Um, it's an interesting question there. It's kind of fascinating. It's a fascinating process, but it's just not something I've ever, ever done before. Is that something you do? Um, uh, Riz W animation. I'm assuming based on the name that that's probably something you do. So now I'm just kind of blocking in some of these forms. This is very gestural at this point. And I have my eyes blurred because I don't want to see any detail. What I want to do is just prioritize the shapes that are in front of me. And it's really tricky, especially as you start looking at shapes that are more, that are more distant. Um, our, our mind tends to make them larger than they actually are. They're, they're very, very small. It's kind of, we, we kind of battle something in our minds. We know that this building back here, for example, is, it's a garage size, it's a pretty good size building, but it's occupying a very small um, portion of that space on the, on the picture plane. And so it, it can be really kind of tricky. Our brain is understanding it as a big object, but we're drawing it as very small. And then the other thing too is like we, we know these buildings on this side are coming off to the, to the right, um, but we're shearing across that, especially towards the back, so much that it's almost a vertical line. So if you do some angle sighting with those lines back here, um, that the line of this building is almost vertical um, and it really starts to kind of radiate down. So as we move across, there's, uh, you know, we have this balcony here and this angle becomes more distinct. We can see that there's a really distinct contrast between these angles. Um, and so I'm working with perspective, but I'm not using any vanishing points, horizon lines, things like that. And in part because this, all of these buildings are so irregular. Linear perspective really works best when, when in a very rectangular and rigid system. Um, in this case, these two walls here are actually askew, so they don't share a common vanishing point. Um, and so if I build it based, if I build this drawing based on common vanishing points and I make certain, certain assumptions, it can actually throw me off. So I prefer to actually build a drawing um, like this from using basic comparative measuring and angle sighting, and then just entrusting the shapes that I'm seeing on the page rather than building, um, building it from uh, a kind of a, a rigid linear perspective kind of structure, if that makes sense. And I'm using the vine charcoal here because it's light um, and it's all going to kind of wipe away. 
I can move things around a little bit more easily. So I can kind of play in this space a little bit longer and work out the basic scale of things. Um, uh, Cynthia is asking, is this like geometrical or mechanical drawing? I think similar, um, you know, I, I guess I'm taking more of a painterly approach to drawing in this um, rather than more of a, a mechanical approach. But, you know, I think you could certainly apply a more mechanical approach to the subject. Um, but like I said, one of the things you just want to be mindful of is that with these older buildings, they're not square, they're not rectangular, and they're not often perfectly aligned. And so you get things that twist and turn in space, and you want to allow your, your drawing to kind of capture that as well. Um, and so as I'm doing this too, don't forget to keep checking in with other aspects of the drawing. So I'm looking at these balconies here, for example. And at, before I drop in these shadows, I'm trying to think about, well, where are they relative to other features? So draw a horizontal guide from there, kind of envision a horizontal line from each of these spaces and see where they intersect other elements in the drawing. Draw a plumb line down or, or visualize a plumb line down to see what's below it. Um, and okay, so if I'm looking at this right now, this space here feels too tight. I feel like this needs to come across, come over a little bit more. And this needs to be angled a bit more. And I don't, I'm not spending a lot of time really dialing it in. I'm kind of making some general notes. Um, but I'm trying not to, to really labor on any one area too much. Um, and there's a comment here. Hi, do you, you sometimes use paper that isn't the same ratio as the drawing, then skew the drawing to fit? Um, I certainly have done that. Um, I, I don't do a lot of that now. Um, and I guess that it could be an interesting, um, artistic choice to do that. Um, you know, often when I've, when I've skewed the drawing, it wasn't a choice. <laughs> like I just, it, I, I was just not being very mindful of the proportions. And so it's easy to look at the shapes of the objects in a drawing and where, where they exit the drawing and then apply that to your paper. The paper is a different dimension. It's going to skew everything. Um, and that, so I have certainly done that before, like I said, unintentionally, but it may be something that is something, it may be a, a thing that you want to do intentionally. So I'm just kind of, again, just leaving myself some notes here on the drawing. There's a lot of this is going to change here. I've drawn this side here. That's going to be light. I actually made it dark and that could cause me some trouble. So just wiping this down with a paper towel. Um, still trying to maintain that that light and shadow structure, but I think what I actually want to do is I'm going to wipe this whole thing down like this. and build it up again. So I've got like the ghost image here that I can continue to refine. Let's see, I've got I'm going to take another stab at it. And what I think I need to do is give myself an anchor now. Um, and I need to I need to check this distance here from the, the side, the edge of the paper to this this line here. And I want to lock this wall down. And that's going to be my anchor. I'm going to build everything else out from that. Um, so how do I want to do that? Maybe I'll take that. If I take this measurement here against the reference photo and I carry it across, it should place me right in the center of the this opening here. And so that's what it does. Um, so that gives me a little bit more confidence that this dimension is appropriate. Um, and it feels like it is. I, I kind of like, when I look at this, it feels like it's correct. And so I think I'm close enough where I can really anchor this down. And then I can go back and address this side now, just comparing everything to 
uh, this, this wall. And I'm not worried really about getting the values accurate because this is all gonna wipe away with the vine charcoal is so soft. Um, let's see, there I see some questions coming in. So I'm just taking a little break to check those out. Um, hello, Jerry, it's good to see you back here. Um, welcome everybody, love hearing how you're, you're watching, if you're drawing, if you're just watching. Um, if you have a completely different approach, again, I'd love to see that. Jan is saying, having been an architectural or a mechanical drafter, I'd say no, especially on the mechanical, which is a whole different set of rules. I'd love to hear more about that, Jan. Um, I cite that this exactly the way you're doing it, even though I know several methods of perspective. Oh, that's, that's, well, it's good to, good to know. Yeah, Any, anything else you want to contribute to that? If you're, you know, having been in that space drawing architecture, um, I'd love to hear how, you know, what, what your thoughts are as we go. Um, uh, and then there's other, that, uh, that is art, not poofed. <laughs> I do skew landscapes to fit the paper, but not with buildings in it. Maybe I would, maybe it wouldn't work so well with the buildings in it. Um, all right. Yeah, that's, that's a good, that's good to, to know. I think with the landscape, um, it can be a little bit more forgiving with regards to proportions. Um, with um, architecture, it becomes a bit, um, yeah, a bit more rigid. So this thing seems off here. What I need to do is really understand this negative space in here where the sky is. I think this needs to come across a little bit more. Looking at this negative space. I kind of lost the full scale. Lost the full scale reference on my screen. There it is, okay. Um, so that lantern is gonna go here and I'm really, what all I'm doing is rather than really drawing objects, I'm placing them. I'm trying to figure out where they go. Ah, this needs to go up higher. So that lantern goes there. And I know this isn't, I know this isn't accurate yet, but hopefully I'm working towards accuracy. And I'm just kind of stating that out loud so that I don't get myself caught into early assumptions about those proportions. Uh, I, I do that so much, you know, draw something and then it, 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 it might be an initial note. And then um, after a while, I just forget to actually correct it. I kind of assume that it is correct. All right, there's this pipe that runs down here that helps me as a, as a plumb line then align other features in the, in the drawing. And one of the things you battle in perspective is, you know, again, our, our brain tells us two different things sometimes. You know, we take in what I consider the optical truth, right? We're looking at very specific shapes and angles and sides, and then our brain has to interpret that. And the brain has to make decisions about how it interprets that information and what's useful. Um, and so if we look at these, these little balconies here, um, optically, they're these thin slivers. We're seeing like these, just these tiny little shapes um, but what's useful for us to know is that they're actually platforms big enough to hold a human. <laughs> you know, we can actually walk out on top of them. So then what happens is our brain can sometimes get confused because it, it knows the literal truth of these as being um, as these larger platforms. And we, it can, we can sometimes let that inform our drawing where we start to make things a little bit more open, uh, a little bit larger than they actually are to kind of fit the, the literal truth of the, the object. I'm gonna reestablish that line of the shadow, do some angle sighting. And then again, it's about relationships. So I'm, uh, when I was, um, as I'm drawing this line here on the door, I'm being mindful of where it is relative to this balcony above. And 
I'm just trying to see that shadow shape. I don't want to get, I, I'm, right now I'm, I'm seeing all that fun detail on the door and I want to start drawing it. <laughs> I, have to, I have to hold myself off from that. Uh, now let's do some angle sighting for this, this um, shadow under here. This one's tricky. Um, but I'm really trying to, if I squint my eyes, you know, if you squint your eyes, you can see it as a shape a little bit more effectively. And this actually comes down below this. And I'm trying to look at that negative space there too, to block in that form. So I'm looking at the negative space, the shape around it, um, this basic shape and how it aligns with other features. And then in that regard, I feel like that I'm blocking in the major forms pretty effectively there. So I'm gonna, I'm just gonna let that sit. And now I'm actually gonna drop in some tone here. I've got this, this old paper towel that's loaded up with charcoal. And I'm using this just to kind of create a gradient in that sky. And now I'm gonna work my way from the background to the foreground. And I, as I do that, I need to be mindful that the, my value relationships are gonna constantly change. These values are not correct here. Um, I've got that, that general shape blocked in. So this took a, took a little while to map out, but I think it's gonna go a lot faster from here on out. Let me grab the 2B. Um, and I'm gonna leave this kind of soft right now And I'm just focusing on that sky gradient back there. And I'm gonna drop in that, that distant mountain, that hillside. Now, so using the charcoal pencil, this becomes a little bit more permanent. And if I use my blending stump, it'll kind of smooth it out. This is kind of loaded with um, charcoal already. Um, but if, if you're draw, working with the blending stump and it's, it's kind of brand new, you may, you may have to work with it a little bit more until it gets loaded with, with charcoal. And I'm going to keep this very subtle back there. And I'm still thinking about, um, I'm still thinking about uh, just shapes of light and shadow right now. I'm trying to keep it fairly abstract. see here yeah using the side of the pencil kind of encourages kind of loose marks kind of a value wash here and at this point we could start to see the light and shadow starting to to make sense there's a light logic here that um and, and that's, what I'm, that's what I'm looking for. I want it to make sense in terms of light and shadow. And it, and it triggers, triggers something in the, the mind that these are objects being affected by light. And I want to get this. Can't really see what's happening in the, in the opening here, but I'm going to go right over the edge of this building. Since I know this is going to be darker on top, um, I can kind of bring these lines right in on top, and then I can create a clear overlap. And I'm going to show you how to do that in a little bit. But this is generally dark in here. And I'm just going to suggest something in there, in that um, in that opening. And then I want to continue to darken this, and then I'm going to go back in and lighten up that sky. I feel like. You know, the, that ugly duckling stage is starting to take shape right now. If you're looking at this right now, I'm looking at it and I'm, my, uh, I have a worry right now that is not going to come together. So I have to be just, I have to just keep moving forward with it. But that's, it happens a lot in drawing. We talk about that, this, this ugly duckling stage where you feel like you have to kind of fight for the drawing. If you just stick with it, you'll get it. And sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes it, sometimes it just 
falls apart. All right, so now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring in uh, just my eraser and refine that edge here. So do some negative drawing to kind of sharpen up that line and kind of work that gradient a little bit. So there's a kind of push and pull in that, that gradient space. And so I'm just using a very light pressure on, with this eraser. And that was, you can see how, how blotchy that sky was there. Um, I want to try to smooth it out a little bit. There's a little, a little spot here, oils in my fingers have uh, kind of interfered with things. So I'm just kind of smoothing that out. Just trying to work on that sky gradient. And again, I'm working from the background forward. Um, and now, let's see. Now we can start to sharpen up some of these edges here. I need to reestablish this line along in here. And this is this is a trick that I like to use. We use this on the bridge drawing. So this is just a piece of drawing paper, like a heavy air stock that I'm gonna kind of use as, to mask this out. And then rather than draw a line down there, I'm gonna run these marks somewhat horizontally to create a, an edge, just to kind of define that edge a little bit more. Um, I'm gonna work on this whole side a bit more, but I wanna give myself something um, as a bit of an anchor. And that, that just gives me some sort of reference over here. So if this becomes my anchor where, from which I'm making all my decisions, I need to have it become a little bit more permanent. And one of the things that's already starting to happen is the, um, the texture is starting to, to define itself a little bit here. We'll work on that. We're, we'll kind of use the natural texture that's forming um, to help us with the simulated texture of the stone. Um, oh, Brent does art, asks, how in the world do you sharpen your charcoal like that? I can't ever get it sharp without it breaking. Let me show you what happened. <laughs> this, this pencil here was almost brand new this morning. And I kept sharpening it down. It's supposed to be this length, and it just kept breaking and breaking and breaking. So <laughs> I don't know as if I'm necessarily the best person to answer that question for you. I was able to get this one to work, and I don't know what happened with that. What, for whatever reason, that one pencil was just giving me trouble. Um, and so it's the, the key to it that I've found has really been it being a sharp razor blade. And I, I think all I can think of is that, that the one that I had done before, um, that I messed up on um, was just too dull. The blade was just too dull. Uh, so that's a really good question. <laughs> um, Cynthia is asking, my paper is so smeared. How do you keep the white of your paper white? I don't really, I, I make a mess of it too. But you know, I have the benefit of working on this table that has this raised lip that my arm can rest on and that allows my hand to kind of float above the page a little bit more. So something like that might help for you. Um, all right, so I have enough of the kind of the ghost image of this building established that I can start to add some of these details in here. Um, and so what I'm going to try to do is I want to try to make very uh, declarative statements. Um, I don't want to mess around in here too much. Um, I'd rather make a few marks quickly um, and, and just and then and move on, not fuss too much. So the, the big thing that stands out is the overhang here in this roof. And so what I want to do is establish its start and end points. 
So what I'm doing is I'm looking back and forth, uh, you know, across this opening, looking at this negative space down in here, and um, and then from there I can uh, strike that angle. So if I get some, I want to figure out what that angle is first. Let's see. Uh, it's got to be a little bit more, it's got to be more of a steep angle, more like this. And so I'm just using this, this scrap of paper as a straight edge. And I find it works better for me than, a, than like a ruler, something that has a thicker um, profile to it. And then there's going to be some detail in here that I just leave out altogether. Um, so I guess I want to make sure that the, you know, the, what, what is taking um, prominence is the overall structure, not the detail. If I focus on the details too much, I'm going to lose the, um, I'm going to lose the overall structure. And there's this tree here that I'm going to, Kind of suggest in here. Let's see. So I may go back into this side a little bit, but I'm trying to I'm trying not to outline forms much here if I can, because um, if I focus on the shapes rather than the lines, it'll read as light and shadow more, and that to me is most critical when drawing architecture is getting that light and shadow correct. Because if I if I if I draw too many lines, it essentially overwhelms the drawing, and the the viewer can get really confused. All right, so then I'm going to drop in the, this shadow here. This angle that looks all right. Drawing an angle for both of these balconies. And then you're going to ask yourself as you're drawing along, you know, what your tolerance is with regards to um, to accuracy. You know, I think we're all going to have a different kind of threshold for when something needs to be corrected. You know, if it's close enough, and you know, something like this. Again, it's a it's a fairly irregular um, rectangular system. The architecture is all irregular, so um, it. You know everything is kind of skewed, and so we, if we try to force it into becoming too precise, then we could get into trouble. Trust the shapes that you're seeing. Trust the angles. Actually, I want to. I've realized I had picked up the six B, and I need to be back at this, the two B pencil, a little bit lighter. So now I'm just kind of going through and making more kind of permanent lines and values here. So one of the things that can be also helpful is to really visualize these planes as you're working. So as you're making your hatch marks, we're not working on a flat surface anymore. We're working on a wall that's receding away from us. Um, and so I'm trying to visualize it, um, that plane and, and, and allow those marks to be in service of that plane and not work against that. Um, and sometimes that's just kind of a feeling about how things work. Um, but it can be helpful just to have that in your mind. And I'm overstating a lot of these shadows, but I'm gonna come back in with the eraser to clean them up a little bit. I'm not worried about protecting this. I want this paper to build up some, some haze. I, I don't want there to be a lot of white because I need to be able to erase out the highlights. And so I want there to be some sort of tone on the page. All right, so. 
And we're going to have to rely on the art of suggestion here, um, suggesting a lot of this stuff. You can think of all that information. You've got, you know, multiple kind of you know, windows and balconies. You've got that light. You've got this overhanging um, uh, eave here in that, that window on the, on the roof line. You've got all this information, and it's all crammed into like a half an inch on the page, this thin strip down in here. Um, uh, Clay is asking a good question about, you just, kind of just came in, so welcome Clay, um, asking where the, the pers center of perspective is. So I didn't, for this one, I did not find um, any sort of vanishing point. I didn't locate that here. It's tricky, so I think if, the, you know, this building and this building are a little askew, they're not parallel to one another. And so they're sh they share different vanishing points. So, so the vanishing point for uh, for this wall is going to be somewhere over here. The vanishing point for this wall here is going to be somewhere over here. So they're going to be offset from one another a little bit. And there's also a bend in this building here. So this, this angle here is different from this one. Um, so we've been using a lot of angle sighting to determine the, the correct uh, perspective here. And a lot of it's just going to be going by, you know, what, what's the feel of this? How does it feel correct? Um, so hopefully that makes sense. So I'm still working on the shadow shapes here, you know, looking for these darker forms. Um, and I'm letting this whole paper kind of just build up some tone. And I'm going to bring in the eraser in a little bit to uh, kind of sharpen it up. And one of the one of the ways that you can kind of determine what what information to let be, you know, and then what you know what details you want to include and what you, which ones you don't, is when you squint at the image, what disappears? You know, is there anything on there that just kind of falls away? If it falls away, then you generally don't need it in your drawing. Um, and of course, the more you squint, the more information falls away. But everybody kind of has a different threshold for that. So um, the, you, know, you may require more detail in your drawing than I do in mine, or you may require less. I think this needs to give them a little bit more steep. And then as the perspective starts to form, then the, when, when something is off, it becomes more apparent. It becomes generally, it just gets easier and easier to make those corrections as everything else falls in line. Um, but it's really helpful to keep an, a mindset that you know, you're always adjusting the perspective and open to changing things. I need to drop this shadow in here. So right now we're still in that ugly duckling stage where everything is a little off. Um, and we're going to go through and we're going to continue to adjust from there. Uh, this this gets really tricky in this this whole area is there's so much going on in there so I'm relying on my my squinting to <laughs> determine what what needs to actually be corrected I want this to work at a distance not necessarily up close so up close it may be a hot mess but um, from a, from a distance it should work out all right so I'm gonna I'm not gonna draw that in there I'm going to give myself a bit of a note for where that, this um, support for the light goes and make sure that it aligns properly with these two elements. I can't quite contort myself here, but I need to make these horizontal. All right. Now, it's, it's interesting, the, uh, when I look at it on the screen, everything's a little bit brighter than what I see in person. So I need to keep checking the screen. If you haven't already, check, you know, set yours up at a distance and look at it. Um, I am going to blend some of these areas and recognize that when you're blending, it's also an opportunity to contribute to the form. You know, it's not just smoothing out marks, but you have an opportunity to make marks you're drawing with this material. I'm 
I'm just using this card as a bit of a masking tool to help kind of speed things along for me. So a lot of squinting, seeing where areas are dark. Trying not to get consumed by the details. But my hope is that even at this stage, we start to have some sort of recognition of, of what the space is um, just based on the shapes of light and shadow. You know, it's really easy to, um, to put an emphasis on the details, but it really what carries our understanding or recognition of the scene is, is the play of light and shadow. Our brain does a lot of filling in for us with regards to detail. So we can, we can build and you know, construct a drawing that kind of works that into the process. It's a trigger for the viewer's mind to, um, to fill in that information. All right. Welcome, Lorraine. Newbie, always welcome newbies. Jan, Scott, I wrote a whole thing on perspective, an architectural mechanical perspective, but it was too long. Okay, thank you for sending that email, Jan. I look forward to it. Um, let's see. Uh, Dr. Hobo saying plastic gloves also help prevent smears. That's a good idea as well. I've, we talked a little bit about gloves in the last episode and you know, I, it's not something that I've really been able to make work for me. Um, although it would make a lot of things easier. I think probably just need to practice a little bit more. So, um, so I've got my eraser here, um, that again, I have it kind of carved into the sharp point and that's going to help me sharpen up some of these edges. Um, what I, this is really throwing me off though. So I need to adjust the exposure there. Ah, that's better. So now what I'm seeing on the screen looks a little bit closer to what I'm actually seeing. You can see the things are actually quite a bit darker. Um, so Now, you know, when, when I have this eraser, I, you know, I want to make sure that I'm maintaining my focus on it being a drawing tool. It's not just a correction tool. And that's something that really helped me when I, when I made that, when I made that realization that an eraser is always an opportunity to contribute to the form. It's not just a tool to correct mistakes. Then I, it really opened up my mark making options. And this is, I have this mono zero eraser that Greg, you had, you and some other uh, viewers had encouraged me to experiment with and boy, do I like it. Just gonna, it's a nice hard eraser. It's a Tombow mono zero. Picked that up at Jerry's a couple weeks ago. And so as I'm going into this space, I'm using this card really just as a tool to mask things. And one of the, what, uh, what I'm looking for is this alternation, this alternating sequence between dark and light relationships. Um, so as I, as I study this edge here, what I'm looking at is the it's value relationship between that and the sky. Um, so here, for example, you have this dark line against the sky that's a little bit lighter. The sky is darker than the lights here. Then we have this dark rim, this dark edge here against the sky that's lighter. This gets lighter, but it's darker here. So then what I may end up having to do is kind of lighten this up just a touch here. So just a light pressure to create a sharper edge against that sky there. There we go. And now I'm just gonna basically just clean up some of these edges here, looking at the shapes of the shape of the lights. And then uh, let's see what needs to happen in here. You can see I'm just resting my hand on this paper here. So it's picking up a lot of charcoal. This whole area is just getting lost. That's all right. And so this is the thing of where if the, if the paper is not releasing the charcoal, um, if it's not getting as light as you'd like, then you can key everything else down, darken everything else around it to create the same value contrast. Uh, 
Um, so now I'm really just drawing with this. Um, and I can just suggest some of these lines here. And hopefully that's cleaning up sufficiently. But we'll see. So I'm just masking. I want to just double check the angles before I before I erase the area around it. But this is how I'm just kind of sharpening up some of the overruns with the charcoal there. And uh, this is relatively light behind that lantern. So I'm just going to lay into this a little bit more. And then I'm going to draw that lantern in on top. And then, you know, by, by toning the page and erasing back out, it creates kind of a modeling of that value that suggests the, um, that suggests the texture of that stone. So I, I'm not worried about it being smooth here. I just use my finger, probably not a great idea because I can put oils on the page, but just suggesting some of the textures here. And, and if I keep my eyes soft and soft focus, then um, I can maintain an emphasis on the light and shadow. So I'm trying not to get consumed by details too much. Although I do need to yeah, sharpen up a few of these areas here. I really want this one to stand out for some reason. So we use this technique in the, in the bridge drawing a couple weeks ago using a, uh, just a piece of cardstock here as, as a masking tool. All right. Let's see. Just checking in the questions. Hello, Germany. Welcome. Um, Rocket434. I'm glad to hear those comments that has been helping you. That's what this is all about. It's been helping me for sure. Um, you know, I, it's really hard to develop art skills in a vacuum, but it's so easy to, you know, just make work on their, on our own. And so that's what this is all about is, you know, if we get together, just talk about drawing, work on a drawing, find a subject that helps to kind of push the skills a little bit. Um, so these are really all exercises. It's all about, um, you know, again, just kind of pushing ourselves and, and challenging ourselves um, as individuals Um, you know, we're not creating, you know, fully finished works of, of art here. Sometimes we, we put so much pressure on ourselves to, to make finished works that we um, forget just to practice. So, by the same token, I often find myself practicing all the time and not actually doing <laughs> finished work. So, I guess we need kind of a, a mixture of the two. Um, I find myself just practicing and practicing all the time. So, all right, kind of like that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna erase this edge here. Sharpen up that edge, there we go. That feels a bit better. Gives a little bit more structure to that. This just, this feels a little clunky right now. Um, and so this is where line work can be tricky like it, this feels so heavy that it's it's kind of cartoonifying that um, that balcony. So I need to I need to clean kind of clean that up and get rid of that line a little bit more. And um, I may end up having to visit that again a little bit later.
kind of sharpen that up a little bit. See how that works. Check it out from a distance. That feels a little bit better. It was just a little distracting to see this, uh, the edges here. Um, so sometimes it's just a, a minor change to something can really have a large impact on, uh, on how we read something. Okay, so I'm gonna draw this support. And this is really kind of an interesting thing. So I'm intentionally using the side of the pencil to create this. I feel like it ultimately leads to straighter lines and they're just a bit sharper and they feel more natural. So I'm intentionally using an overhand grip and I'm trying to visualize that path first before I strike. Um, so here, for example, envisioning the base of that lantern Uh, and then kind of building it up from there. And I'm taking this slowly because I, I don't want to overdo it. I'd rather say too little about this lantern than too much. This is, something feels off about here. Um, and then, and what can happen too is if you if you break an edge, um, and a detail like this is is broken, the the viewer's mind rushes in to fill in the missing information, and is often often does a better job filling that in than than I could ever articulate clearly on the paper. <laughs> so um, the uh, I kind of like to let the viewer's mind do something. So here I'm just gonna a very light line to to map out the. Um, the top of that um, that lantern. And I want to make sure that it that it holds onto that wall okay. So kind of suggesting it more than anything. I think that works out all right. All right. Let's see. Uh, Clay is asking, I find it tough when looking at references on your phone because it's small. What do you recommend? Actually, I recommend doing both. I, I know exactly what you mean. So like for me right now, I have the image in front of me. That's exactly what you're seeing. It's, it's on the screen right here. So it's a small reference equivalent to having it on a phone in front of me. But then I have a large one here on a big monitor off to my left. And so having the two to bounce back and forth can be really helpful. So using the small one to establish the big forms, having the big reference for the smaller details um, can be really helpful. Um, it, yeah, when it's too small, it, it can be kind of uncomfortable and, and we may not have quite enough information. If it's too large, then it, it can kind of somehow, sometimes inhibit our understanding of the major forms. All right, so this, this is often here, this is what I'm noticing, is um, if I look at this relationship between these two lines and the reference photo, they're much closer together. And so what I need to do is figure out what needs to change. And I, I kind of feel like this needs to be a little bit bigger. Let me kind of close in this gap a little bit more. See how that works. Yeah, now I gotta ask myself, how, what am I gonna do there? Because we're already, what time is it? We're already an hour in. This is taking a little while longer than normal. Um, so I, let's see, what do I wanna do? I think I do wanna make this a little bit larger. Uh, I think I think that might that might do it here. So if I if I shift this over just a little bit, I need to make this just a little bit larger. So 
So yeah, that kind of closes in that a little bit more. Um, that feels a little bit more appropriate. And I'm gonna I need to rely on the power of suggestion a little bit more than what I'm doing. I'm kind of getting a little caught in the weeds with the details. Well, let's move on. So the shape of these shadows underneath here can be really helpful in establishing the perspective of that wall, that plane. So um, that's what I'm focusing on right now. And I feel like that reads a little bit better. Um, let me, now I think what I want to do is before I move forward and stay here in the background and um, kind of clean up this back edge do some drawing of that landscape. Let's see how that works. I feel like that anchors that a little bit better. Gives a little bit more definition back in here. And I'm being really careful not to outline things. And we talked a bit about that before, but um, outlines can really flatten out a drawing. So I have to be really sensitive to that. And in a way, what can ultimately read better sometimes is to do kind of, kind of constellations, just kind of dots that, that we visually connect together. Just try to suggest forms as much as possible. Let the, again, let the viewer's mind fill in that, any of that missing information. All right, so um, let's see. Just checking any questions. Monica is asking, what can you use to remove charcoal from an area if erasers don't completely remove it? That is really tough. Um, you know, I, in the past, I have used uh, a razor blade, um, which you may find has mixed results because that will ultimately damage the surface of the paper. Um, and so it could cause some other kind of unintended consequences. Um, so you just want to be careful with that. Um, but the, you know, I can see that like right in here, for example, I'm really laying in on this eraser and it's not lifting up at all. So that's done. And so then my only real recourse is to, um, darken the area around it. And I, when I, when I kind of embraced that as an option, I found that it, it expanded my understanding of value range. Um, and it allowed me to feel more comfortable going darker with values. And so it wasn't necessarily a bad thing. And you may, um, you may discover a, a lot about values that way. Um, so it hopefully even, you know, it, it like it may ruin the drawing and you may say that his drawing is a wash. And if that's the case, then um, kind of turn that into a learning opportunity. And, and that, that's a really a, a prime opportunity to learn about value relationships. So, all right. So now I'm kind of moving up that wall. I think maybe I'll, I started to work in this area a bit. Um, Kind of observing this this rough edge along in here. Um, let's see. All right, Miss uh, M uh, Pandy, it's good to hear you love drawing. Looks like you've you've done some some uh, competitions that you've won. That's awesome. All right, 
So what I'm going to do now is just, I'm going to start to refine this shadow here. And I want to keep my marks. I think I'm going to keep them vertical, or if anything, if I'm not doing vertical, I want to be mindful of the perspective here. So you can start to see the angles of the stones here, and they're going to kind of radiate down. So if your horizon line is somewhere down here, the lines are going to radiate up this way and then down this way. Um, and because these are kind of ir irregular stones, you don't have to be too precise, but if you hold that general, uh, that general thought in your mind, it can help to reinforce the perspective. So, all right, let me mask this, erase off some of the highlights here. I'm not being super careful with it because I want it to be a, an uneven tone. And I don't know if you could hear that, but when I'm you know, scoring that line down, letting it skip across the page, um, you know, I, I, if, if I force it into a really strong line, it can end up working against me. So I'm trying not to do that. There's my paper towel. I'm gonna smooth this out. This is, what this is doing is this is forcing the charcoal in the paper and, and I, right now I'm cringing <laughs> because I know it's gonna be really difficult to erase that and, but I did it anyways. Um, so, this is still the 2B, but I want there to be some tone there so then I can come back in and erase out brighter highlights. And so we, we've talked a bit about a strategy for texture. Um, if you're new, I wanna um, you know, kind of cover that for you. But if you've been with us for a while, you kind of know my, my general approach to it is, is that, especially with an irregular texture like this, what is most helpful is to kind of understand the general shape and direction of the marks and locate where you're at. So what I mean by that is if I'm looking at this area here and trying to capture that texture. Squinting my eyes and just taking in the general shapes and angles in this area. Coming down to this area and seeing what shapes and angles appear there. Moving over to here and seeing how those angles change as well. Um, and, then, and then just striking as, as best as possible. So, um, and, and allowing the materials themselves to do some of the work. Uh, if I, when I fight for texture, when I really try to control every little thing, it gets really difficult and I end up making work that doesn't feel very natural. It, it, um, it feels kind of too forced. And so if I, if I allow the materials to simply kind of create marks, react to the surface of the paper, let it kind of skip across the page um, while holding the, the shapes that I'm seeing in my mind, uh, you know, as I look at the reference image, um, I can ultimately kind of create something that feels more natural. So reminding myself of the perspective, you know, lines that kind of radiate down like this, when we get to the center of the page, we're generally horizontal. I can be thinking about that and allowing these marks here to become a little bit more horizontal. And I'm allowing the eraser to kind of rock, roll in my, my hands, and just playing with the materials rather than really trying to be explicit with the individual textures and trying to match the photo one-to-one. -one. Um, suggestion is really helpful. Um, so I'm just starting to, to kind of suggest this and the, the, what really works well for texture is to um, work it multiple times. You see, um, Really keep working on an area. So I like to build it up, kind of knock it down a little bit. Um, and kind of make observations about what's happening on the paper. Mad moments go. I was making a comment about that foreground. Yes, you're absolutely right. And that is something that I kind of have in the the back of my mind as I'm working is knowing that, you know, this kind of works here, 
but every, that's all going to change once that foreground gets established. So there's a bit of anticipation that's happening. So actually, what I want to do, I'm going to do more drawing with the blending stump. So I picked up, picked up some material here, and I'm going to use this to suggest some of the shapes of the stones on this wall. And I'm, and I'm playing around with um, just you know rolling the, the the object in my fingers, playing around with squinting and blurring my vision. But I'm trying not to force a perspective. It's just about suggestion right now. And then with these stones, what can be helpful is to identify just a few of them as landmarks for your drawing that you can kind of come back to and place them properly in the context of the drawing. So if I'm looking at the general shape of the door that's forming, identifying some rocks and placing them down there. And I'm looking at the shapes of the light and shadow more than anything. So it's kind of allowing this drawing to emerge on the page through an observation of light and shadow. And this is really a tricky shape. And so as the, the stones here form the right side of the door, and I'm trying to observe that, but I want to be careful not to, again, create an outline, but I need to sketch that in to some degree. So it's very, very light. And it's a little bit off, but I, hopefully it's enough to convey the idea. Um, and this is, again, something that, you know, you as an artist will have a different sensibility than I do about accuracy, right? So um, does this need to be 100% accurate um, when you compare it to the reference photo, or is the reference photo just a jumping off point for you to then, uh, you know, change and play around with proportions? Um, and then within that, you know, there's a, there's a range. And so, you know, you may, um, you may look at mine and say, that's way off. You need to be much closer um, to the, uh, the truth of the photograph. Or you might look at it and say, "Well, it, it could be it could be much more inventive." So, um, Brent does art. Scott, did you consider using tinted charcoal on this drawing? I think it would have been a little tougher. That is a, I, you know, I didn't, um, I didn't consider that, and I'm not sure why. I think that yeah, this would have been an interesting one because you have this contrast between warm and cool. With the tinted charcoals um, that we've used before they tend to be a little bit harder and kind of scratchier. So it would have just required a different approach overall. Um, but it would have been interesting actually to, to play around with that. I haven't used that since the iceberg drawing. So if, yeah, this, this shadow here is going to have to be reformed, but I'm trying to give myself a little bit of an indication of the, the, that stone there. And then this, this is a really distinctive shadow here, so I need to actually draw that in. And then, and then both of these shadows need to be a bit more transparent, so we're going to talk a bit about that later. You can kind of see already, like right now, if you look at this area of the shadow that I'm working on, in the reference photo, you can see some bounce light in there. It's not a really dark, dark like I have here. So I'll have to adjust that. Um, just kind of thinking out loud here. And lightly scoring that line. You know, we often, in areas like this, you know, one of the things that I've always battled is looking at something like this, recognizing that it's in light and wanting to make everything light. 
And so much of what creates light in a drawing is, are the darks. <laughs> so, you know, especially when you know, with a, an additive process like this, we, are, we have to create that understanding of light and shadow through our understanding of the dark forms. But, you know, that's something that I have kind of reminding myself more than anything at this point right now. But so just very lightly, I'm, I'm using this eraser to create some variety and some of that reflected light in the shadow here. Um, but I don't want it to compete with the, um, the highlights at all. I need to make sure that it still reads as a shadow. And then I can go back in and push a little bit of the darks to push that variety a little bit even more. You know, looking for some of the shapes of these darker stones in that in that shadow area. There's um, still light and shadow effects. There's highlights and cast shadows all in there. So that's what I'm looking at right now. Let's see how that reads from a distance. I'm feeling better about it. You know, I think about it sometimes if I were to paint this, how I might, how I might do it, and this is. So this is really a bit of a painterly approach that I'm taking. All right. Seeing some shadows in the texture here. Again, just holding the, holding the shapes in my mind, but not being too controlling over trying to mimic them exactly. Um, letting the materials do some work for me. And so, but using an overhand grip, I find, really lends itself to creating more naturally formed marks that read more as a convincing texture. And I think that for me, that's, that's kind of more important is creating marks that feel like they capture the texture more than it being, um, having the correct proportions and 100% accurate shape when compared to the reference. So um, that's what I'm gonna to start to prioritize now is you know, when I make a mark, does it feel like shadow? Does it feel like the, the way the light bounces off of the, these materials? And I, it, it's difficult to see, but like there's a lot of lifting and dropping and when I'm making these marks. It's not a consistent mark. Uh, you know, as I move up and down, I'm lifting it off the page and dropping it back down. I'm rolling the pencil in my fingers so that I have a different um, part of the surface of the pencil being engaged on the paper. And now kind of looking a little bit more critically at the, the smaller ref, the smaller image here on the screen. I'm going to study that a little bit more. It's equivalent to stepping back um, from your drawing. So make sure you do that. It's really a helpful thing. Ah. Some of this, some of this eraser is just really building up on the paper. And so with this uh, mono zero eraser, it's it's I'm treating it just like a, a drawing material as well. It's just same as the charcoal, rolling it in my fingers, playing with the pressure, letting it skip across the surface. Um, you know, really kind of letting it do work itself. Okay, I think I need to figure out this the windows on this door. That bottom edge is almost horizontal right along in here. Um, so I want to just kind of suggest that I need to, th these two lines are really the most critical because that's going to establish the perspective of the door, and then within that I can be a little bit more free with regards to. Um, the detail. So I'm just looking at that shadow shape across the door. Um, and I'm noticing that this shape here of the rock, a little bit off, but that's all right. I want to, I'm not going to correct it a whole lot. I'm just going to let it feel like a naturally formed rock. How's everybody else's drawing going? 
Anybody struggling? Anybody having some wild successes? So I'm going to run these marks kind of vertically, knowing that we've got the vertical um, nature of the slats on the door. But I'm not going to be super precise with it. Uh, oh, there's a question. Clay Hendricks is asking about framing. Would you recommend for framing drawings like this as cheap as possible? Um, you know, that's a, that's a tricky question. I worked as a picture framer for many, many years, and so I've got a lot of kind of experience um, kind of contemplating this. Um, you know, I think if it is a drawing that you want to preserve, if you get to the point where you're going to frame it, my suggestion is to, I don't know, it, it framing, it takes money, right? You got you to put money into it. And I, I generally um, err on the side of, you know, spending more money to do it right than less money and, and it not work out because I'm still spending money no matter what. If, you know, if I'm worried about it, you know, just preserving it, then I, I wouldn't necessarily frame it. I would probably take a sheet of... Um, of uh, the acid-free plastic um, and cover it and then store it in a flat file or something until I am ready to frame it. Um, if you are ready to frame it, then uh, getting acid-free uh, acid mats and UV protecting glass, I think is the, the way to go. Um, and then, you know, the, the wood itself, the actual molding on the frame is perhaps the least critical and with regards to protecting your work. Um, but definitely get the, the UV protecting glass is my recommendation. But like I said, I think if, if you get to the point where you're going to frame your work, um, then like I said, no matter, no matter what you spend, it's, it's a fair amount of money. So I, I typically spend more money to, to make sure I'm really happy with it. Um, you know, sometimes you can get a really great frame for not much money and that works out. That's the best scenario. If you can find something that works great. Um, and it's uh, going to protect your drawing, then, and it's cheap. You're, then uh, that's probably the best scenario. But if it's something you're going to be looking at a lot, you know, I, I typically say, you know, find the find the molding, find the look that really makes you feel good about it. All right. Um, I need to reestablish a shadow, so I've kind of lost that overall shadow shape. You can see the 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 kind of remains of the uh, kind of the ghostly image of that initial shadow shape I placed on there at the, the start of this video. Um, but like, uh, going back to that framing thing, I guess it's just my perspective. You know, everybody has a different relationship with it. So just kind of whatever you feel comfortable with. But like I said, I, for me, the priority is getting the acid free mat and UV protecting glass because it's the light and the acids that are going to do the damage. And I would see I would see some people that you know would spend spend a good amount of money, but then skimp on the glass, and then you know it can be really hard on the that light can be hard, and it all depends also where it's going to be hung. So if it's in a fairly dark space, then it may not may not be as big of an issue than if it's really being blasted by light. Uh, Zephy Lily is asking, do colored pencil drawings need to be under glass? Uh, yeah, I think generally anything on paper you want to put behind glass. Um, to kind of protect that from humidity and other things. All right, so I think I want to... Ah, this needs to come up. Uh, and so th on that note too, the, you know, the paper you're working with, you know, if you're if you're at the point where you know framing is a, a thing, then you you probably want to make sure you're also working on acid-free paper. So this um, this Stonehenge paper that I'm working it with is acid-free, um, and so over time that'll it'll hold up better. And that's why why I like the cotton rag paper is because 
you know, with a wood-based paper, you know, it's the lignans in the pulp that are acidic. And sometimes that paper can be, or an even mat board can be read, listed as acid-free when it's not necessarily acid-free. It has it, it's just, it's been balanced by adding a kind of a, 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 what is it, lime, I think, to balance out the acids in, that are naturally in the paper. Um, and whereas the cotton is naturally less, less acidic of a material. All right. I kind of like what, you know, I didn't do as much work here yet as I did in the preparatory drawing, but I kind of like the look that it's creating. So I need to think about how much I want to um, add to that when I get to it. And we'll probably add more detail, but just kind of thinking as I react to it. So just kind of suggesting the door here. But kind of figuring out the structure of the door right now is kind of more than I want to tackle, I think, in this live stream. So I may end up just letting this be somewhat suggested. And hopefully, like, you know, if, if you're doing this, you may end up putting a bit more time into that area. Um, but what's really critical in these shadow areas is to have some sort of depth. So you have your general value, but then you need to push that a little bit more, um, having some darks in there that... Um, that help to establish that value structure. Just kind of dropping in lines that's, that represent those you know, kind of the rivets in the door. But I'm gonna, I think I'm just going to leave that as a bit of a sketch. Mad Moments goes, and I like the shadow on the door. Awesome. Um, yeah, this one's this one's a tricky one. <laughs> it's a little bit different from what we've always done, but um, let's see. Cheryl saying it's been fun trying this on a digital program. What program are you using? I'd be curious. Um, let's see. Hello from Holland. All right. Lots of people from all over the place. I'm just checking here to see if I missed any good questions here. If I did, I apologize. And if there is one that I missed that um, and that you'd like me to answer, uh, please type that in again. I, I, uh, I, I don't want you to feel like I'm ignoring you if you answered a or you asked a question and then I did not answer it. So because um, I am not ignoring anything at this point. So all right. Just kind of clearing my head a little bit. Um, I think what I want to do is establish this section along in here a little bit more. There is this. This is this is off. Um, so when I look at the relationship between the shadow on the wall and this building here, I think this needs to come up a bit, and that makes that makes sense. That that angle, yeah. This angle needs to be more steep, and then we kind of cut down, and that's what's helping to create that volume in the door is this change in that shadow's path. And then I think I need to bring this up. And so if I look at the reference photo, the shadow exits the paper. If I draw a horizontal guide across, it would intersect right about here. So. Let me bring that up. And I'm using the side of the pencil so that sharpens the pencil. So if I have a, a sharp point when I need it. And I also know that I, I still have my 6B charcoal that I can switch to that's going to give me deeper values. So um, I'm not worried about it being too dark. It's going to read as dark now. Um, but. Um, yeah, I, I, like I said, I can go a little bit darker. Sorry about that. That that probably made no sense. I was <laughs> uh, drawing and and thinking and talking sometimes can be a real challenge. So I I got lost myself in there. So I apologize. So 
So I'm kind of being intentionally loose with this area. I'm not worried about it being smooth because that's all going to be, it's all going to be rocky, stony texture. So I'm not worried about that. And then right in here, I'm going to switch to this, switch to this eraser. This edge along here is going to be really critical. So what I'm looking at is the, again, the value relationships along that edge. Uh, and I want that to vary if I can. So what I mean by that is right here, maybe making that stone darker than the door. You know, it's still relatively dark in there, but that part a little bit darker than the door. And as we come down here, they kind of equalize in their relationship. And then when we come down here, I'm gonna make this, actually I'm gonna darken the door here a little bit first. And then lighten this area. I'm gonna pull out a stone along in here. There's a bit of a, a reflected light on that stone. And I don't think I measured it properly, but it's all right. These, some of these, I wanna capture the overall spirit of this place. Maybe a little bit off in terms of accuracy. So we've got the 2B. There, so that, that's what really is gonna bring this to life is that, again, looking at that alternating sequence, the, the value relationship between these objects. So in here, this is all dark against the light stone. And if I continue that relationship down here, I think it's gonna flatten out. So having a spot where it reverses, where this now is darker than that, helps to kind of tie everything together. Hopefully that makes sense, but. Um, uh, puppy artist, are you drawing in gray tones? Yeah, this is all black and white. Uh, you know, so we're just using charcoal here. So we're creating the values through a, a control over pressure. Um, oh, actually right in here, there's a, there's a hinge on the door that's gonna really be helpful. And that's right above that thing right there. Again, to break up that edge. Okay. Andre, thank you for the the comments there, I'm glad to hear I'm a, an effective communicator. I try. I've heard from some of you um, and I always welcome, um, you know, emails from anybody, comments uh, when, I, when I speak. I've had, you know, some of you kind of articulate some kind of concerns about, you know, the, the, some of the things I've said and I always welcome that. Um, an opportunity to kind of clarify my position on things related to drawing specifically. Um, but it's been really a lot of fun meeting a lot of you virtually and hearing from you. So, um, you know, connect with me on Instagram or send me a message there or something. And um, love to chat about art. But if I, if, if there's something that I'm kind of describing and, you, and it just is leaving you question marks, <laughs> you're like, what? Did you just say? I, 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 I always love the opportunity to kind of clarify that and hear differing opinions because I've been challenged in a few ways that have been really helpful for me to establish a new perspective on things. Um, and so, uh, and that's kind of what I want to establish in the environment here is a space where you feel open and kind of articulating some of the things that you've been challenged by and, and being open to, you know, questioning your own processes and um, so, especially with people viewing from all over the world, things can get lost in translation sometimes. So, um, this, is, this is really tricky right in here because the value relationships are all kind of muddled. Um, it's hard to tell where the corner of that stone is. So I'm just gonna try to suggest it in a few areas. Uh, right in here, I think this can get darker and then kind of trail up, get a little kind of gradation there, kind of pull that into that corner. All right, that feels better. Whew. 
Um, this is really tricky in here where you have that, that bounce light coming in from behind this building, kind of catching in that shadow area. Um, using this smaller eraser to kind of get in here. How's the weather where everybody's viewing from? Here in Colorado, it's nice, sunny, a little chilly. But otherwise, a beautiful day. I can't wait to do the stones on the ground. That was a lot of fun in the preparatory drawing. This one's taken a little bit longer. Where are we at right now? We're an hour and a half in. My hope is that we'll be able to finish this within the next 30 minutes or so, but we'll see. Um, so just using the blending stump, not really picking up anything. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this, this eraser here to kind of capture some of the bounce light in this. So I'm pressing, you can see, more than kind of scrubbing with the eraser. And what I'm trying to do is understand that perspective, the angles of those rocks, and capturing that angle more than anything, rather than really try to be precise with the um, with the lines and replicate the photograph exactly. What's that? I think I need a little bit, a little bit more in here. This area gets a little bit washed out, but. Give it a little bit more structure. Uh, yeah, JRW3, yeah, this is uh, Stonehenge. Thank you for answering that, Brent. Um, and that's what I'm using for this one, but I, uh, I, do, I really do like that Strathmore paper too. Um, if you have a favorite paper, anybody, I'd love to hear it. I think experimenting is really an essential part of being an artist. And so, so I'm just trying to be careful right in here. If I, if I, if I raise a highlight, I want to make sure that it still reads as bounce light and it doesn't get confused for being, um, direct light. All right. So I'm going to add a little bit more texture in here. That's the 6B. What do I need to do here? I need to, I need to give this a little bit more structure. So I'm trying to think through what I need to do for that. Um, and sometimes the best way to think is just to start making marks. So that's what I'm doing. I'm going to be careful as I drop these lines and they're feeling really dark. So I'm just mostly just tapping on the page more than anything. And that gives a little bit more depth to that, uh, that texture there. I don't like this. Something, that, something is not right along this edge. Yeah, that's the, <laughs> some of the some of the the charcoal is really grabbing the paper right now. So um, it is what it is. Uh, just the shadow cast shadows. Not I'm not digging it. That feels better. Okay, yeah, that feels like a better shape there. And when I say when I when I'm looking at it, does it read effectively as that? The, pers the light and shadow in perspective. Okay. Um, so now what I'm doing is what I'm doing is evaluating this plane, especially right in this section here, um, to make sure it feels solid. Because I'm losing something in here. It doesn't. I don't have structure there. So I think if I just give it a few 
few indications, it will start to bring this whole section into life. It's one of the things I you know, love about um, some great artists. I look at like Sargent's drawings and uh, you know, have, he'll have like a, just have like one line that's perfect. <laughs> you know? And the whole form comes together. It's just exactly what our, what our mind needs to complete the rest of the picture. Um, we go a little bit a little bit structure in there that feels better feels like it's more solid um, just kind of pulling back over on this side a little bit kind of give that a little bit more form okay actually what do I need to do I, I before I layer this on I want to get this background here done so I want to suggest the stones on that ground plane and so um, I'm going to drop in some tone and there's some bounce light coming in right in here and then you can see you know the change in texture on the stones um, you know where it's, the light is bouncing off in kind of cool ways so I'm just using the paper towel smooth that out and I'm going to use this and try to really kind of understand the shape of that, that light and that shadow. And so because this is so far, we're really shearing across that ground plane. Those lines get really thin. Um, so even though they're big stones, because of the angle where, which we're looking at them, um, you get these thin kind of angles. And so I'm trying to kind of hold that in my mind as I work. And as we come down, it gets more open. We're looking down at the ground plane here where we can see the tops of those stones a little bit easier. So what I'm, what I'm doing is just trying to establish that value relationship in particular back in here. And this shadow line should be sharper. How's that read? All right. And so now, using the side of the pencil here, I'm just going to kind of tap along the page. And this is going to start to suggest some of the, the shadows and the cracks on the, on the ground. And part of what I'm doing now is looking at, um, it's a kind of a blotchy surface on the, the paper there. And I'm using that as my guide. So seeing those dark areas, recognizing them as shadows, and targeting those areas where I want to drop the lines in. So rather than mimicking the drawing and forcing the, I mean, mimicking the photograph and forcing the drawing to match the photograph, I'm seeing what's happening on the page and using those marks to my advantage. And we can start to kind of work our way down the, uh, the drawing. And so as we, as we look at these lines, there's kind of a horizontal aspect to those stones, and then there's kind of a perspective, the orthogonal aspect to it, where these lines start to um, kind of recede in perspective. And there's an area like in here where it gets everything is kind of muddied, and then some of those stones become in sharper focus. So just using the side of the pencil and this overhand grip, I'm allowing it to roll in my fingers, and I'm placing these, these marks on the page rather than trying to physically draw each stone. And then what I'm going to hopefully do is as, as these marks come together, uh, I will start to see them as stones on the, on the page, and then I'll start to draw from, from what's happening on the page. 
And so as I'm, as I'm looking at the reference photo, what I'm looking at are just trying to see what the scale of the stones are in this section. Uh, how do those angles change? How does the scale change? And then try to capture that um, rather than mimic the, the stones one-to-one. -one. I, I feel like I've been reiterating that point a lot. So if, I, if it feels like I'm just beating a dead horse, then <laughs> I can get off that topic. But um, you know, texture is really kind of a thing that I, I really enjoy contemplating and this is where it just it's so much fun to see what the charcoal will do for me and then react to the marks that the charcoal is is making um, and see how that can start to kind of kind of serve an understanding of that perspective and and um, light and shadow and all that All right, what do I want to do? Okay, so I can use the blending stump and do the same thing. Be thinking about the perspective of that ground plane, the overall shapes. And I try not to labor too much on the, you know, studying the reference photo, taking a quick observation. So what I'm, when, I'm, when I'm working, I kind of know where I want to go in the reference photo. So when I look up, I look at that one specific area, try to find the shape I'm looking for, and then go back to the drawing in that one spot. Um, and then and move through the drawing that way. So as I'm working down here, I need to study it, look up at the reference photo, go right to the spot I need, make a quick interpretation of that shape, and then get back to the drawing and try to apply it. And then that's starting to form, and it's starting to feel like the, the, it, it's in shadow. Um, and I want to make sure now that this is all reading as one shadow shape, not competing with the rest of the, the lights in the, the sky area. Which I can erase that a little bit more. Pump up that contrast a little bit. All right, so what do I need to do? I think I'm worried about smudging this area as I work, so I'm not gonna finish that yet. I'm gonna come back to this. I'm gonna work on this area now. Um, I think what I need to do is actually kind of blend this. So I'm gonna mask this area so I don't have to think too much about that, protecting that edge. Creates a relatively sharp edge. Um, all right, thanks for the comments, everybody. Cynthia, glad to hear this. You feel like this looks better than the reference photo. I feel like I'm fighting for this one a little bit more than I'd like to. <laughs> but uh, hey, my brain is kind of all over the place today. So. Um, but that's what drawing's all about. Um, you know, some days they go well, sometimes they don't. And what's what's really kind of funny is like, you know, kind of anticipating how other people will feel about the work. And I don't know if anybody else experiences the same thing, but you know, for me, I, I remember doing some paintings or something. I'm like, oh my god, I really feel like I nailed this one. Everyone's gonna love it. And you know, I would show it to my friends or I'd show it in class or something, and nothing. <laughs> They're like, oh sure, that looks okay. And then I would draw, you know, work on a drawing or a painting and, and feel like I've really just missed it for whatever reason. And I get a lot of positive feedback for it. So it's um, sometimes we're our own worst critics. Um, there's a bit of a shadow under here that I want to get. And so as so I go, I'm going to go to the 6B. Um, I'm going to be careful with this line because I... I'm doing something that I generally don't like to do, which is, you know, there's the path of the shadow that runs this direction, and I'm running my pencil along in that direction. Um, and it, it generally reads more effectively as a shadow when I run, um, run these marks this way here to create that shadow. 
So I want to be really careful, and so um, one way to, to manage that is to make sure that that line is a little bit broken. Because if it's too solid, it'll actually flatten it out. And I want to create this perspective that it, you know, I want it to feel like it's moving um, back in space. All right, so I think what I want to do, lifting up some charcoal here, let that be a little bit darker. So there's a bit of a gradient here. Um, it's a little bit smoother. And then you get these kind of distinct stones. I got the 6B, so I'm going right for the 6B right now. And I'm gonna find the darks. So as I'm, as I'm doing this, I'm trying to visualize the perspective lines here on this wall. So again, they kind of radiate. If this is, if this is horizontal, they radiate up like this and down like this. Um, and I, I don't want to necessarily render each and every stone because I don't have a lot of time. But if I have that in my mind and I know where kind of horizontal is and I know the angles up here, I can, um, I can kind of mimic that perspective. And so if I can kind of work the whole length kind of at the same time as much as possible. So hopefully that makes sense. I mean, a lot of this re is, re requires Again, holding that, those thoughts in your mind as you go. And, and sometimes it's just kind of intuitive. As I come down here, I'm letting those angles change as we move back. And what I'm thinking about is, you know, I've got this, this vertical aspect to the wall, and then I've got the, those orthogonals, the diagonals that lead back to the vanishing point. So I can drop the, I can move the pencil up and down to create that, that vertical um, dimension. But the start, the top, and the bottom of each stone can vary, right? That's what that's the angle that can change, and that's what I'm holding in my mind. So as I'm working towards the center of the wall, those are generally more horizontal. As they come down, I can change the angle of that, of the, the the pencil, to start to reflect the the perspective there, and I'm allowing the pencil just to roll on my fingers to create these natural marks. As we come down along in here, the stones get a little bit tighter together, closer together. And now I can also start to do what I was saying earlier, look at the dark spots, look what, what, what's forming on the page now, and let that guide me, rather than really try to match the reference photo. So if there's dark areas here, you know, that start to read like light and shadow, build it from there. I'm going to need to pull out the eraser and, and pull out some highlights in here, some, some not highlights, but reflected light in there. And with this being a stone wall and all these irregular forms, we don't need to get the lines of perspective um, nice and precise. You know, we want them to be irregular. We want this to feel like a natural wall and you know all, each stone has a different shape and size if we get into a rhythm where everything starts to feel more repetitive um, then it's going to start to feel less natural this is this is I, this is probably my favorite part of drawing is is when the you know you just kind of let the material do its thing and see what happens um, and if, when it, sometimes it, like I said, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, but it's all it's just a drawing. We're going to do a lot of them in our lives. So if this one doesn't work out, that's all right. You know, let's do another one. And what I need to do is now I've got this, just like we did over in this area, I'm not going to really scrub with the eraser. I'm just going to kind of lift off. Um, again, holding that perspective in my mind. Um, you know, hopefully then 
some of these these marks will feel like they they kind of align with the perspective of that wall. It's kind of a bit of a ridge along there. Now, this is what I love about charcoal is that it's so you can manipulate it so much. Um, and I know you know some of you may be cringing at charcoal. I know I've had those moments myself where just the it's just dirty. <laughs> But I love it, that's what I love about it too. But I've also had times when I'm like, I just don't want to get dirty right now. I want to, I want to have something that's clean and precise. And sometimes I just want to make a mess on the page. And that's what charcoal is really helpful for. But yeah, again, just kind of bouncing around the page, trying not to get stuck in one area too long. And now I'm gonna evaluate to see if this is actually reading like bounce light. I think it might be too strong. But. I gotta share out saying watch your step. That's right. You know, this is all over the place, this the, the stones here. Um, as soon as uh, uh, writing something in Spanish, and unfortunately I don't speak or read Spanish very well, even, I, even though I took it in high school for many years, it did not stick with me. So I apologize. I hope this is working out okay for you. Um, thank you for joining us. So if you're, you know, if, if say you're, if your drawing is just kind of lost, just have fun making marks. And I think that I, we, it's been a while since I talked about it. So for some of you, you may have heard this before, but I just, one of the, the most helpful experiences for me was being in school and kind of asking permission from my instructor to make bad drawings. And, um, and so I did, and I just played around with materials and I didn't try to make a good drawing. I just drew. And I, it was really helpful for me because I was getting burned out at school, tired of, of trying to do well and um, kind of comparing myself to others it was just kind of wearing me down. So I just asked if I could do, a, do some bad drawings and they sure, sounds good. So I did. <laughs> and they didn't turn out so bad either. So um, you remember there was one of the things we talk about here is there's there's drawing and then there's the drawing, right? There's the act and there's the object. And, um, and we're each gonna have our own um, way of prioritizing those two things. You know, for some of us, it's gonna be, everything is about the drawing itself. For some of us, it's everything is gonna be about the, just the process of it and letting the, the, the drawing, the object form around that. Um, and, you know, we're all gonna have a different way of of thinking about that. Um, and I think it can be helpful sometimes to, to challenge that, you know, and do some exercises where it's all about the object, do some exercises where it's all about the process. And kind of, and just keep pushing. And that's what we do as artists is we keep pushing ourselves into, into new ways of understanding our subjects and understanding the materials. Understanding our connection with the art form, whether it's oil painting, whether it's charcoal, graphite, whatever. Kind of knock this down. There's a very light pressure right here. I don't want to really kind of smudge anything. I'm just kind of knocking it down. Okay. I'm going to feeling happy um, looking at this wall. Let's see, it feels, it does feel a little flat to me. So what do I need to do? I think I need to. I think I need to lift off a little bit more here. So just use with a kneaded eraser, it's a nice irregular form. I can start to create some rough surfaces that way. And what I'm doing is just trying to create some more value contrast in this area. Um, so that as we move from the back wall to that front wall, just from a value perspective, like one of the things I like to do is actually kind of close off a portion of the drawing 
and see if the perspective still holds? Do it, can I look at just this section and understand that this is farther away than this? Um, and, and that can sometimes point me in the right direction to understand what I need to do. Um, let's see. There's my 6B. All right, I think I might um, add a little bit more kind of definition to some of these forms. So looking at, looking at the dark spots on here, I'm gonna to start to just kind of clean up those edges and give a little bit more kind of detail and structure. And that might also help to push some of that depth along that wall. Um, so I'm just looking at the shapes that are forming and I'm making them a little bit more deliberate and more defined. Yeah, that, that feels better. So as I, if, so, so much of, of depth is created through the use of diagonals, right? And so what would happen if we get rid of those diagonals? Um, and so what's encouraging is that as I get rid of this diagonal, I can still understand the depth along this, this wall. And so that's kind of what I'm going for. And then that way, when you add the diagonals, you're really reinforcing that depth. You're using both value and uh, line to create that, that depth. All right, so just kind of tighter marks in here to show kind of a variety of stones. It's interesting that the smaller stones were used at the bottom. I don't know anything about masonry, so <laughs> if anybody can tell me why that is, it seems like there's these smaller stones along the bottom and larger ones more in the middle. I would, intuition would tell me it'd be the opposite, but I don't really know what I'm talking about with regards to stone masonry, so. Um, I know from France, Thank you for the comments here. Um, love all the comments, Cheryl. All right, um, and if you are new, uh, just know that we welcome any questions, observations, comments. You know, if I need to work on an area, you know, shout that out. You know, um, you know generally everybody's really cool and gives me, you know, an encouraging words and um, suggestions on how to improve in a, in a kind way. I've never really had anybody who's been a, you know, difficult to deal with. So, um, but I know sometimes people can be a little shy about providing feedback. So just know that we welcome that here. I think what I want to do is I want to bring this, I'm going to thin light line along in here. See how that does. So from a distance, I hope that line kind of disappears, but we can, we register it and, and hopefully it brings that that corner of the wall forward a bit. But not along that whole length, so just in a few areas, lightening up that edge. There we go. And then this eraser has got a sharper edge so I can add a little bit of detail in some of the highlights along in here. But I don't want to make them too bright. Uh, so as I lighten up this area, that contrast between light and dark should also advance this portion of the wall. So it, you know, it's not a, a super high contrast, but it's higher contrast here than it is back there. Now I'm gonna move across here. This is gonna be the last area we finish, so I'm gonna go in here and start to render in some of these stones. I'm gonna knock this down a little bit, so then I have some room to maneuver with regards to value, so I can come back in and I can start to lift up some of those highlights again. You know, this is bounce light in here, so I don't want it to be too strong, so it's a very light pressure with the material. And we notice that it's, it's bouncing a little bit more right in here where it's the smoother stone. So that must be where everybody walks. Um, and then what's tricky is, is kind of capturing the, the, 
variation in color of the stone, the local color of the stone, um, uh, and versus the, the value of, um, of the stone because of light, because of light and shadow effects. Um, just kind of a thought there. So I'm just kind of erasing out, thinking about the shapes of the tops of the stones and recognizing that as we go back, they just get smaller and smaller, thinner and thinner. Um, and I'm, again, I'm not trying to be too precise with that, but I'm holding that general principle in my mind as I work. So just opening up the marks as we come forward, closing them as we recede, and in hope that that will start to suggest the texture. And I can start to really kind of define the shape. So again, looking at the marks that are already on the page to help me draw those stones rather than try to rework these marks to match the, the stones in the reference photo one-to-one. -one. How's that read? I just want to make sure that it still reads as the shadow um, as I'm doing this. Um, and if, you know, if this is too bright, then I just need to knock that down, but I feel like it's working out all right. Uh, how's everybody else doing? Anybody stuck on these, the stone area if you're drawing along? You know, it's one of the things that I remember, it's probably my earliest art memory is actually drawing a stone wall and I had uh, I can't remember who it was, whether it was a teacher or like a babysitter or something like that, pointing out that, you know, all this, the stones in a stone wall are all different shapes that kind of lock together, and it blew my mind. Um, that would have been, I don't know, been five or six or so. And um, I think about that every time I draw stones. And then from then on, you know, I grew up in Maine where there's lots of stone walls and just noticing them as we would drive along or walk through the woods. All right, drop that and then kind of define some of these stones again. Again, looking at the stones that are appearing on there, targeting the dark areas and then dropping in a bit of a kind of a deeper shadow in those dark areas. Not a hard line, just a little, little dots and dashes here and there. And then just looking up at the reference photo to gauge, um, you know, again, where I'm at and the scale of the, the marks in each of those areas. So like right in here, I really need to get tighter and that'll help to push that back. I feel like this is, this is too ambiguous. I feel like I like what's happening here and I like what's happening here, but that transition in between isn't, isn't working. So I need to focus on that. Uh, Justine is coincidentally I have a scenery drawing with rocks to draw on sand and I was looking for tutorials on, tutorials on how to draw rocks. Awesome! <laughs> well, welcome. Um, so glad you found us. We do this every Wednesday 3 p.m. Eastern. Um, and then you can find a link in the description to the show page on Artist Network um, where you can share your work. So we've got all, this is episode, what, 77? Um, and so we've got all 77 episodes up there and each episode has its own page on which you can share your drawings. And many of you have done that. Um, you can find the reference images, the list of materials. You can also buy materials through the page there. Um, I have a, a link to my kind of recommended materials to get started. So if you need to get a whole kit, you can. If you just need a few, um, few materials to replenish your stock, you can do that too. And I need, what I need to do is I need a strong a strong exit uh, off the bottom of the page. And that's, that's something that, you know, when you think about the composition, you know, how the forms that exit the page, um, in general, the way those forms exit the page um, should be visually pleasing, or it could be helpful if they're visually pleasing, but it's most critical in the bottom, that's my perspective at least, is to, to make sure that the lines exiting the page are, are strong that's what grounds everything um, and it creates a sense of depth. Um, so I want 
kind of some kind of dominant lines that lead us off there. But I don't want to. I don't want to fake it. But I, so I want to see if there's anything that I'm observing in the reference photo that I can use as a guide to help me help me with that. So. All right. So I think I'm feeling like the marks that I'm making here are too a little bit too more too rigid. Um, so I'm switching to this overhand grip that is going to make kind of looser marks. And. Of darken that a little bit. Pull that into that shadow. So then I feel like I need to. And I need to race up this, the light on this walkway a little bit more, make that a little bit stronger. You can see that that this path of wear that I want to make noticeable. Okay, there. All right, I like that. So if I look at it from a distance, I feel like it's got weight, it's got depth. I understand where it is in terms of light and shadow. I feel like this has solidity. I'm just kind of think, talking through the things that I'm thinking about as I, as I evaluate this. Um, and it doesn't look exactly like what we're seeing in the reference photo. That's okay. Um, it's okay because I say it is. <laughs> may not be okay with you. Uh, like you, if you're drawing along, you may have a different sensibility about that and you may look at it and be like, oh, it's not exactly the same. And that's fine. That's, what, that's part of what makes each of our approaches different. I love it. And then some of you might like, yeah, you could totally push it and make it more unique. Uh, that's something I guess I'd be curious to hear from you all is, is when you're working, how much do you like to, um, really kind of adhere to the um, you know the, the truth of the, the the reference whether you're working from life or whether you're looking working from a photograph or you know do you just use the reference as a starting point or somewhere in between Okay, let's see. Alvina, is the sharp, darker line on the end of the wall causing it to come forward instead of receding? Um, I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, the end of the wall. Is that, are you talking about this edge along in here? It could be. It could be flattening it out. It does feel a bit flat. So if I follow along in here, you know, we have a contrast that's changing, the relationship between values is changing as we move down. But at the same time, this is pretty consistent. It's mostly what's happening back here that's changing. So let me, that's, that was a good idea. That's a <laughs> good prompt there. Thank you. Um, I think, you know, what I could do actually is, is kind of play around with this value structure a little bit by lightening it back in here. And then one of the things I'm noticing, and this is a real, that was a really good observation, if, if, the, if that is indeed what you were pointing out, but I'm, I think that is, um, I can play around with that a little bit by um, darkening this back in here. So then we play with that value relationship where we have this generally darker than that space behind it, but we flip that where now this is darker than that. Just in that one spot might be enough to really kind of um, you know, play with depth there. Uh, I, I thank you for bringing that to my attention. If that, I, I think that's what you were talking about. So if not, let me know. Um, I do wanna kind of play around with this line up here, give it a little bit more structure. Um, Penny, thank you for the comments. Sharon, thank you for watching. Um, and then, oh, uh, Claude is asking, consider lightening the top of the mountains. That, I, that, that's a, it's a good thing. Let me come back to that. I think what I want to do is make that evaluation after I finish this, and then I'll, we'll take a look at that and then see. I'd love to hear what, 
what uh, more about what you're thinking. Is that something you would do? Um, is um, yeah, kind of curious to to hear how people would push and pull some of these things. Um, uh, thank you for those comments, sharing your ideas here, Cheryl. That it's a kind of the the reference is a starting point for you. Um, Yeah, I'm kind of a two minds sometimes. I mean, I think um, for me, I'm just trying to think out loud, you know, I think there is a, a certain, um, there's something about really kind of holding true to the proportions in the space and being capturing that space by looking critically at the, um, you know, the, the unique proportions. Um, but then there's also something to be said for kind of moving things around to suit the design of the drawing um, and then does it become about the composition does it become about the design or making decisions based on what you know what ultimately expresses uh, the, the essence of the space you know or sometimes is the space just a jumping off point to be so that an artist can make statements about composition and color Oh, there's so many different ways to approach art. <laughs> so many different ways. Most of the time, I think I'm doing it wrong. Um, this feels too bright right in here. Let me knock that down. Um, so stones are starting to form in here. So what I'm looking at are some of the darker spots. And I kind of like, I like the way in the reference it kind of vignettes itself a little bit. It gets a little bit darker back in here. So I wanna, this is distracting having this light corner. We're doing on time. Oh man, we're over two hours. I usually try to wrap this up under two hours, but we're almost done. I think I'm just about, you know, just need to suggest some of the, the darks in this area um, along this wall. I'm happier with what's happening back in here. I, man, I could probably work on this forever. Um, and I'm trying not to outline the rocks, but I'm looking for the shapes of the darks that are created in the kind of the cast shadows of each stone. And again, I'm, I'm just being general with it, kind of making some observations and then striking. Yeah, um, so I want to move this thing along for you all. And also holding that perspective in my mind. So you kind of considering the, the angle of these shadows that we're observing. Allowing the pencil to roll in my fingers to create these more marks that are more naturally and kind of suggested of suggestive of more natural marks. That was a clumsy, clumsy way of articulating that, but hopefully that makes sense. Okay. Um, let's see. Um, Alyssa, is this your reference pick? I, I did not take this picture. This is the one from Pix, Pixabay. Um, and Brent is saying you'll drive yourself crazy trying to exact draw exactly what's in the reference. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, th I think I tend to agree with you. Um, at the same time, I also know a lot of artists who do draw exactly like the reference, and they seem to be sane, <laughs> so they figured it out, uh, which is really cool. Okay, so I need to start evaluating what forms or what rocks are starting to form? Am I starting to see a sense of structure and texture in here that I can then push and pull? Elise is saying, looks like a village along the Camino de Santiago. I don't know where that is, but that's awesome. I have never traveled. I mean, the only place I've been outside of the US is Japan when I was younger, just for a couple weeks. So I've never, never really traveled much out of the United States. Very much looking forward to doing that. Okay. All right. So now, similar to what we did over here, just going to be kind of 
tapping along here at first, trying to think, understand the structure of light and shadow. See if there's something I can learn about just by looking at the reference photo about the, the, the logic of the light and shadow that I can apply to this and these, these stones here. You know, there's some stones where the light seems to catch along a, a ridge and others where they kind of catch along these more broad planes. Um, you know, these, these sections where you get more round stones. And I want to pull out some of the highlights up in this area as well. So I'm focusing so much in the shadow area that highlights kind of getting washed out. Let's see, Romare saying this must be a durable paper. It is pretty durable. This is a pretty heavy stock and I like it. Um, I'm not being too kind of aggressive with this paper, but I do like heavier weight paper because it allows me to really lay in on the eraser when I need it. Um, if it's light paper, it kind of forces you to become more delicate, which um, can sometimes inhibit things. Anybody else have a kind of a preferred paper? I know I asked that, but I don't know if I caught any of the responses. I mean, we talked a little bit about the Strathmore, which I do enjoy the Strathmore paper. I don't really know if I've worked on paper that I don't like, but so much of, so much of drawing is actually reacting to the materials. And I really like it when I encounter new materials and it forces me to kind of think about how to solve the problems that that new material presents. How's that work? All right. So again, just now evaluating the drawing to see, does it create a convincing sense of texture, especially at a distance? Um, not, does it look exactly like the photo? Um, I do wanna, I do wanna kind of work this highlight area a little bit more. I think what I think is I'm gonna switch to this, well, that's the 6B, I need the 2B. Um, and give myself a little bit more tone, uh, some of these rocks here. So I need to, I'm gonna kind of darken in some of these areas. I wanna make sure that I'm not creating like these, these regular kind of repeated forms, make sure everything feels irregular. Um, See what happens if I just allow this to kind of scrape across the page. And so for me, when, when you're working with tex texture, it's a lot of building up, taking it down, trying it again, building it up, knocking it down. <laughs> and you kind of work that area, you know, multiple times. You know, it's, it's not a matter of kind of hitting it in one go the way it is with some, um, some aspects of a drawing are best served when you just kind of strike first and confidently. So. I feel like there's, a, there's an imperfection in that, that it's just kind of scratching the paper. Um, Steven is saying working on watercolor paper. That's awesome. I used to do that. I. Um, and when you're working on watercolor paper, are you using graphite, charcoal? What materials? I used to work a lot on watercolor paper. I don't know why I stopped. I'm curious how, how you use it. Um, Yeah, you, Cheryl, saying yeah, the U.S. is really a young country. Let's see, sanded papers. Yes. Oh, I, when I've done some um, uh, uh, some pastel work, I really enjoy working on sanded, but I've never really done it for charcoal much. 
All right, so I've got a bit more of darks there. Now, now let me pull out this, Get some highlights in here. So I'm studying the shapes of the highlights in some of these areas here. And the way the light is, seems to be catching on this rim, um, kind of coming in from this direction. Um, Uh, Steven is saying you were using charcoal today on the, the watercolor paper. That's awesome. I, I do remember, I think sometimes when I've worked on uh, watercolor papers, like some of the papers would hold the, the charcoal a little bit more than others. And I think that may be why I kind of stopped. Um, and then sometimes it would really, you know, it would hold the charcoal and then erase off really nicely. But I should try that again. Thank you for sharing that. It's Kind of inspiring me to try that out again. Getting this is perhaps looser and more sketchy than I've done with other with other subjects, but it's taking a little bit longer than I anticipated. Sometimes those sketches, sketch marks are just what we need. Sometimes it's fun just to make a, a mess. <laughs> you know, we talked a bit about that before. It's like, you know, drawing can really be a way to express our kind of, our inner energy. And, and sometimes it can be a way of, of adjusting it. Uh, there's some days when I just feel like antsy and I want to make really big aggressive marks. And I'm feeling like that perhaps a bit today. The idea of being precise is not resonating with me. So I, uh, yeah. But sometimes, you know, I, I kind of force myself to tighten up and be slower just to bring, bring myself down into a more comfortable state. So just using this Tombow Mono just to sharpen up some of these edges in a few areas, you don't need a lot. Um, but sometimes that can be enough to really um, you know, suggest detail more than anything. And then where's the 6B? Is that the 6B? There it is. I do want to add a little bit of depth to this. And then a thin line right in here. All right, how's that work? I think that's that's about it for me. I'm, I'm tapped out. <laughs> I don't know if the drawing's done, but man, I'm, I feel like this was a lot of drawing, uh, a lot of focus, and a lot of fun. So... Um, I do want to take some time to kind of just check through some of the comments, um, see if any, any other uh, kind of questions while well, I'm just kind of tidying up a little bit, but I think this is pretty much it for the drawing. Um, let's see. Romero is saying, I do blend on my graphite landscapes, but don't blend with stumps or finger when I do graphite portraits. Yeah, we, uh, somebody else had kind of posted about that. Uh, I think that's a really good observation to make, you know, when, when to use your fingers and, and not. I like to draw with my fingers. It's a lot of fun. If this is a drawing that I'd be framing or giving away, I would be much more mindful of that. And I think it's something to be careful with because the oils can really, they can damage a drawing. They can make it difficult. Um, and so the, uh, you do want to be mindful, but at the same time, I think when, with the, the mindset of it being an exercise and kind of pushing and challenging ourselves and, um, you know, sometimes that can be inhibiting to have to be careful with that. So, um, but I, yeah, I love to hear those comments. Anybody else have anything to say about kind of protecting the drawing from your fingers. Um, it's an interesting concept. So just kind of refining that draw that hill there, giving a little bit more shape. I don't know if I like that, but we'll see. Um, uh, Romero said, do I urban sketch when weather permits? I mean, sometimes I do. Uh, you know, I'll do a sketch before I do a painting. I, I go out, I'm a plein air painter. So I go out and paint as much as I can. Um, and I, I went to an urban sketchers, uh, kind of symposium a few years back and that was awesome. Just kind of getting exposed to that world. 
I don't know, are you uh, an urban sketcher yourself? Um, all right, thank you for the comments. I have a beer now, <laughs> maybe I'll have a beer. Um, that's art, not pfft. Uh, may try a flat eraser, we'll see. Um, yeah, oh, you use a Q-tip or a cotton ball. I've never really done that. That's a, uh, yeah, I know other artists who have done that as well, so that's, a, that's something I'll have to try out. Um, and you use smoother paper. All right. A surrealistic feel. That's interesting. Yeah, this is kind of a, a moody space. I, I just really wish I was in this place right now, wherever this is, because it looks awesome. Um, I think I do. But I think that's about it. Um, I'm working on next week's right now. I don't quite know what I'm going to do, so it's going to be a bit of a surprise, but I should hopefully get it done this afternoon and get that posted on Artist Network so we can see what we're working on next week. But we meet every Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern, to draw together. So I want to thank you all for joining me again. Um, check out Artist Network. Go to the, the page. Share your work. I can't wait to see all of these drawings that you got. Um, and uh, I want to erase this highlight. And thank you for all for sharing your process, your observations. Um, I appreciate it. This is the highlight of my week. I love it so much. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, and we will see you all next Wednesday.